Let me say a word of prayer and we'll jump in to week two of Exploring the Revelation. God, thank you so much for this night. Thank you for this group of people. Thank you for their desire to uh, better understand your word. Thank you for giving us your word and inspiring us. And we pray that you would give all of us together wisdom tonight. We, we seek to study um, this, this book that can be very confusing and um, a little bit overwhelming, honestly. Um, I just pray that you would give us um, a sense of understanding those things that we can understand and grasp um, and a growing sense of confidence, again, in the encouragement that there is in this book and that despite how things can look and feel, you are on the throne, Jesus, and we thank you for that truth. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, tonight we are uh, looking at chapters 6 through 11 and 15 through 16. Now, that starts with a question. Yeah, what happened to 14 and 13 as well? Um, that's kind of and weird. 12. And 12, too. That, we missed that, too. Um, let me explain what's going on there. Uh, and I, I think this will be a better way of doing it. Um, so the reason we're not simply doing, you know, 6 through 16 tonight is because tonight we're tackling the three sets of seven. Uh, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls. So if you've read through Revelation before, you probably familiar with those terms. Um, and so that's what we're tackling tonight, as well as significant numbers, which is fitting since we're talking about three sets of seven tonight. Um, next week, we're going to look at the visions that come in the middle of Revelation uh, in chapters 12 through 14, as well as 17 through 19. So next week, we'll look at these sets of visions and images. And then the final week, we'll go back to just one big chunk and do Revelation 20 through 22. Does that make sense? Um, so that way we deal with um, all these three sets of sevens all together. Before we get started, I want to let you know where we're heading. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of a review from what we covered last week. And then um, the main teaching content or lecture, if you will, will be about significant numbers in scripture in general and in the book of Revelation and apocalyptic writings. Uh, then Jake is going to give us an exegetical summary of these three sets of seven, kind of just summarize the things that happened there. And then uh, we are going to do a test case like we did last week where we walk through how each of the four different lenses would understand. We're going to do that for the seven seals. And then, get ready for this, you guys are going to have to work. Um, so before we do Q&A at the end, you guys are going to try your hand at interpreting the first four of the bowl judgments um, with each of those four lenses or views. Because as you know, the test is not what we say and what we know at the end of the day, but what you understand and are able to practice and read scripture on your own. We really do want to equip you, give you tools that you can take and use. And so we want to practice. And then we'll close with Q&A depending on how long things take. Uh, so, a uh, quick review. Uh, the first chapter of Revelation, first four verses, John says that this is the revelation or apocalypse from Jesus Christ. He says in verse 3 that blessed are those who hear and listen to the words of this prophecy. And then he says, John, to the seven churches, which looks like a letter, right? So last week we looked at three different genres in this book. And so your first slide there, your first image is that of um, our dog, Clover. Uh, Clover is sweet and crazy. She's a little over two years old. And um, thankfully she's biting our kids a little less than she used to. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, Clover is, uh, actually, what, what would you say, what, what breed would you guess Clover is? Basically? Yes, you are right. Clover's <laughs> a mutt. Thank you. She's a cute mutt. So uh, she's a she's a Catahoula leopard dog. She is uh, Australian Shepherd and Pitbull. At least we think. Oh wow. Those are the things we think. Yeah, I know. Um, That's part of the writing. Yeah, I think that. I have to put my mouth on you. Um, and people who know more about dogs than I do will say, like, you can actually see traits of her. Like, oh, like her behavior or the way she runs or her personality are like one or the other of those. Here's the point. Uh, the book of Revelation is a mutt. 
<laughs> it's a mixed breed book, right? It's an apocalypse, a prophecy, and a letter all mixed together, just like clovers, a catahoula, an Australian shepherd, pit bull, all mixed together in this package deal. Uh, that's the book of Revelation. It's a mutt. So first review of these four views. Again, three different genres, and depending on how heavily you lean on different aspects of these different genres, it comes up with these four lenses. Um, so preterist, that Revelation is a letter. It pertains to first and second century events. Idealist, it's really timeless. Um, it deals with big, huge principles, right? Like God's victory over evil and justice. <clears throat> Historicist says uh, it started being fulfilled in John's day and then has been ongoingly fulfilled throughout history. And then Future says it's almost all about the events right around Jesus' return and second coming, right? So again, this is just review. Uh, last week, someone asked, okay, but which one do you go with? And I didn't actually answer that, Brandy. It was a good question. And, um, and I want to answer it. I don't even know why I didn't answer last week. It's because you got distracted. I got distracted. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and I want to answer it for a simple reason in that, um, just to say, honestly, we will probably not do as good of a job presenting the views that we don't hold. And so if you tend to interpret the book of Revelation through one of the views that I don't hold, I'll do my best to present it well, but I might not do as good of a job. Um, but you deserve to know uh, how we read and interpret the book. And honestly, Jake and I are a little different in that. So uh, if you're looking at your handout, preterist, idealist, historicist, futurist, first of all, again, there's aspects of truth to all of these. But your job is with every section of the book of Revelation to say, what would the original hearers, readers understand? How would they interpret this? And as I've tried to read Revelation with that focus, um, I tend to read it <laughs> with multiple lenses. But um, as a futurist, idealist, preterist, okay? And in that, in that order, that's why I said it in that order. Um, and what I mean by that is, first of all, preterist, that's easiest to understand. I think it was a relevant book prophecy, writing to first century churches. I think God had a message to them. Um, and some of it was about things that happened in those days, especially Revelation 2 through 3, these letters to the churches I take in a preterist way. I don't take those in a historicist or futurist way. Um, but a lot of it, I think, is futurist. I think a lot of it is that prophetic telling where God is giving John his picture of the future, and he's describing that picture. And maybe even John doesn't realize that a bunch of the stuff he's seeing is not about the first and second century. It's actually about the return of Christ. And so I think a lot of it is futurist. And then thirdly, idealist. Um, the, Jake and I were talking about like the way to describe this. And the way I would describe it is this. When I read the book of Revelation, what I see is it, it's describing this tsunami wave that's going to come of trouble and injustice and bad, terrible, beastly ruler. And the tsunami's wave, wave is going to come right before Jesus' return. So in that sense, I'm futurist. I'm idealist in the sense that I think there have been a lot of waves throughout history. Right? A tsunami is a really huge wave, right? but there's also regular-sized waves. And I think Revelation paints this picture that says, yes, there's going to be a terrible ruler, going to be terrible persecution and suffering, right before Jesus' return, and there's going to be cycles of that throughout human history. So again, that's I'm futurist, idealist, preterist, probably in that order. Um, as far as historicist, I, I don't really buy that it was primarily historicist. I think some things do line up with history because idealism is true, in my, in my view. But that's where I'm at. Um, Jake, you want to share where you're at? Yeah. So if you guys look, um, you said a line halfway in between preterist and idealist. That's where I am. So um, I'm on this line where I say, hey, I think that Revelation all the way until chapter 20, so all the way from 1 to 19, is about the specific events that are happening in the first and second century, even maybe just the first century. And that this is one of the waves in a that is coming to them. It's the one that they see right now, but that later with the fall of Rome, the same thing happens. And later with, you know, different empires falling, this thing, same kind of ideas happen, but this is the one they're going through right now. So that's the one John's talking about. 
Um, and so it would say in the same way that like, if you think about the, um, during the book of Daniel, when <clears throat> Daniel is there and he serves under two different empires and one of the empires is punished by another empire, that that is a wave that happens before John writes, but that is kind of in the same pattern of empire does things, empire gets punished by God, new empire does things, new empire gets punished by God. But the book of Revelation is about the Jews who crucified Jesus and Rome kind of overtaking them. Okay. Cool? Does that make sense? Cool. So Jake's a preterist idealist. I'm a futurist idealist preterist. <laughs> Great. Can you guys be wrong? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but again, you deserve to know where we're coming from. So that's where we're coming from. Can you guys it's, still be friends? No, <laughs> probably not. Um, okay, uh, if you turn over, we're going to start looking at significant numbers in Scripture and Revelation. And I was, I forget who I was talking to about this, but it was cracking me up because they were like, oh, like there's numbers that mean a lot? I'm like, yeah, like almost every number <laughs> means something. And I just gave you one example for every number, but every single number I listed, I could have given five or six or in some cases, more examples. Um, one is a significant number in scripture. There's one God. Uh, two is a significant number. Two tablets of commandments that uh, Moses was given. Uh, three persons of the Trinity. Four gospels. Also, four cardinal directions, which comes up several times in the book of Revelation. The north, the east, the south, and the west. Uh, five books of the law, or Torah. Uh, six became uh, symbolic for the number of man and also rebellion. And by man, I mean humans, but humans in rebellion, because humans were created on the sixth day. But also, do you remember what else was created on the sixth day? Land animals, including snakes, serpent. So the number six became uh, freighted with this is like the number of rebellion, because men disobeyed God, who were created on the sixth day, and the serpent deceived them, who was also created on the sixth day. Uh, seven days of the week, and, and seven is a special revealed number expressing God's perfection on the seventh day. That's the Sabbath, right? And then Christians actually picked up the symbolism of the eighth day, the eighth day of the week. So if you read some early Christian writing, they would say, some, sometimes they say, we worship on the first day of the week. Because remember, before Jesus rose from the dead, Saturday was the Sabbath day for Jewish people. And that's the day of worship and the day of rest. But then Jesus was raised on Sunday. And so some people say, oh, that is, Jesus was raised on the first day of the week. And other Christians said, no, he was raised on the eighth day of the week. Uh, the first day of new creation. The first day of the new, this new world that he came to bring. Um, this is just for fun. Um, and again, to show you that this is, this is not uh, something that's just true of... The book of Revelation or apocalyptic writings, it's true in scripture in general. Once you start realizing um, the loaded meaning of numbers, you start to see it other places. So in John's gospel, um, scholars say you can divide it pretty neatly in half. Um, the first half is called the book of signs, and the second half is called the book of glory. And the first half of the gospel of John is called the book of signs because if you read through it, John never calls... Jesus' miracles, miracles. He calls them signs because they're saying something about Jesus' identity. And he even begins numbering. The first sign Jesus did was turning water into wine in Cana and Galilee. And then so on and so forth. He says the second sign was, and then he stops counting. But if you count along, here's the fun part. Um, some scholars say the seventh sign is the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Other scholars say like, no, 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 you miscounted. The seventh sign is Jesus rising from the dead. And as I have said, I'm like, no, there's definitely eight signs. And the eighth sign is Jesus rising from the dead, I think, according to this, just Luke's opinion. Um, but you can read through it yourself. And I don't think this was accidental. Like John was purposely saying, these are seven signs that point to who Jesus is and his true identity as the Messiah and the King and our Savior. And so again, this is something that's true, not just of, of the book of Revelation, but scripture in general this um, weight of numbers. And uh, I think the same John who wrote the Gospel of John wrote the book of Revelation. So it makes sense that he has all these numbers going on, the three sets of seven that we're going to look at tonight. 
All right, more numbers. Uh, Ten Commandments. Uh, Twelve tribes of Israel. Thirty is the age of ministry. That's when priests would begin serving. So if you were in the priestly line of Aaron, you would begin serving at age 30. And how old was Jesus when he began his ministry? Around 30, right? Uh, 40, uh, 40 years in the wilderness, um, 40 days, Jesus fasted in the wilderness. 40 comes up all the time in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, 42 is six times seven. That comes up several times. That comes up in the genealogy of Jesus. Um, it's also the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. Did you? <laughs> All right, you got it. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jake. <laughs> Bye-bye. Um, I was uh, just joking. That's from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. That's not in the Bible. <laughs> Sorry. 50 uh, is the year of Jubilee. Also, um, Pentecost happens 50 days after Passover. And then 70, um, 70 elders went up on Mount Sinai. Um, even the later Sanhedrin that was operating in Jesus' day always made sure they had 70 members in the Sanhedrin. So what you'll notice is with those last few numbers, you start to realize it's not just numbers that have significance, even multiplications of those significant numbers have significance, or additions of those significant numbers have um, special significance in Scripture. So for example, um, the number 40, let's just talk a little bit more about that. Uh, 40 years became significant, again, because it came up so many times, but it also became synonymous with the year, the, the length of a generation. So in Numbers, um, when God punished the people by saying, look, you can't come, this generation will not be able to come into the promised land. This generation will die in the wilderness. They'll wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And so you see 40 years becoming synonymous with one generation. This is just food for thought because this is prophecy, not in Revelation, but about the end. Um, scholars debate, and I've been confused what to do with some of Jesus' words about a second coming. I don't know if you've read like Mark 13, Luke 22. These can be confusing passages of scripture because basically the story is um, Jesus' disciples and Jesus are in the temple. And they're like, this temple's amazing. And it really was amazing. It was one of the wonders of the ancient world, this great huge temple that Herod built in Jerusalem. And they're like, look at this place. This is amazing. And Jesus says, not one of these stones is going to be left on the other. And then they ask him, and it's significant what they ask him. They said, um, when, or when will this be? And what will be the signs to accompany your coming? I, I just butchered it, but it's something like that. They actually ask two questions. They think they're asking one question. When will one stone not be left on another? And when will you come in power? They, when will all this take yeah. place? And when will you Thank you. Back? Yeah. And when you read through it, I think Jesus is answering both questions and they have different answers um, because you read through it, a lot of it does sound like the destruction of Jerusalem that happened in AD 70. But then other things sound like his second coming and his return. Um, and you see that tension even in those verses I put in there where Jesus says, truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. And then two verses later he says, but about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the son, but only the father. Like, which one is it, Jesus? Is it this generation or no one knows, right? And again, I think he's answering both questions. This temple will be destroyed within this generation. And interestingly, you take 70 minus 30-something when Jesus said this, it's right around 40 years. So food for thought as you read uh, not just a Revelation, but these um, things that Jesus prophesied. If you have your Bible, open it up to those passages. Oh. Um, there's two passages listed there. And if you would, just put a finger in one and a finger in the other. All right, Revelation 5.11. Who's got it and what does it say? 5.11 says, Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and four thousand thousand thousands, and ten thousand times. They encircled the throne and the living creatures. Perfect. Thank you. Um, does anyone have a different number than what Brandy just read? Mine just says myriads. Yep, okay, good. Anyone else say anything else? 
Revelation 5.11. That's what we're looking at. 10,000 times 10,000, 1,000. Okay, good. All right? Good. 10,000 upon 1,000. Okay, good. Uh, and how about 916? 916. Mm. Okay, uh, read it. Some, yeah, read it out. The number of mounted troops was? 200 million. 200 million. Anyone else have anything else? 10,000 times 10,000. There you go. Okay, why the difference? Do you hear the difference? Oh, 10,000 times 10,000? Why is 10,000? Yeah. Why is 10,000? What did you say? Why is 10,000 times 10,000? Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> there's some issues when you go from Greek to English, right? And here is one of them. Um, this is a case where I think it's very clear, regardless of your other views, that these numbers are functioning the same in both places, mostly because they're the same words in both places. So there's two different Greek words for the word thousand. One of them is myriads, which is actually where we get myriad, right? Myriad. Myriads upon myriads is where some of your translations get that. And in these two verses, it's the same words, myriads upon myriads. So one is like a myriad of myriads. And the other one, Revelation 9, 16, is two myriad, two myriads upon myriads. Hmm. Now, we're like, okay, so how do we take this? But from what I understand and have read, this, this word specifically, and in this phrase especially, myriads upon myriads, functions much closer to like our English word ton. I say, I went to Costco and I bought a ton of bananas. How many people think I bought 2,000 pounds no, of bananas? I spent a ton of Oh, money. I spent a ton of money. <laughs> 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 oh, you get great. Yeah, I did get a ton of money. Oh, I love it. I love it. Right? I love it. Um, but that's, that seems to be how this number functions, right? It technically means 2,000, but we mean a lot, right? Myriads upon myriads. So technically, very literally means thousands upon thousands. And you can do the math and say a thousand times a thousand angels. But the sense of it is a countless multitude. Then the question comes, okay, the word other places is a different form of the word thousand. Um, but the question comes up that you have to address, that we will address week four of what about the thousand year reign of Christ? Is that literal thousand or a lot? Uh, perfect or, um, comes up with the 144,000. The saying literal 12,000 from each tribe or 12 multitudes, 12 tons, 12 bunches from each tribe um, and the dimensions of the heavenly Jerusalem, 144,000 cubits. Is that literally how big is it, or is it a ginormous city with ginormous walls and gates? Um, again, when we get there, I will tell you what I think about those and why. I'm just going to fly through the next slide really fast. Bad numbers. Um, three and a half is a bad number in Revelation. Why? It's half of seven, duh. <laughs> <laughs> Seven's a perfect number. If you cut it in half, that's imperfect now, right? not good anymore. Um, some background, if you read through the book of Daniel, you might have heard the phrase time, times, and half a time. I was always so confused about how someone someone said, I was taught, like, that's three and a half. I was like, time, times, and half a time is three and a half? Why isn't it four and a half or five and a half? Like, but in Hebrew, you can do something you cannot do in English. In Hebrew, there is not simply singular and plural. There is also a dual. So when it says time, that's one. When it says times, it's not the plural, it's the dual. So one time, two times, and half a time added together is three and a half. Um, so even carrying over for, uh, backward from the book of Daniel, time, times, and half a time, this number three and a half seems to have some bad connotations to it. And simple math that I missed for a long time is that if you just take that and put it different ways, three and a half years is roughly 42 months which is also roughly 1,260 days. So when you read through the book of Revelation, whenever you come across any of those numbers, it's okay, and you should actually be like, oh, 1,260 days, that's 42 months, that's three and a half years. These are all bad numbers and synonymous together. 
Uh, gematria. Um, anyone familiar with this? Gematria, does that sound familiar? Some of you guys know about this? Okay, Gematria is the Hebrew practice of assigning number values to letters in the Hebrew alphabet. So A equals 1, B equals 2, C equals 3. Now, I mean in Hebrew equivalents, in Hebrew equivalents, and yeah. then they would add the, the, the various numbers assigned to the different letters and different words up together. So there's a famous one that if you do this in Latin with the word Jesus, it comes up as 888, which is kind of cool, since 8 is like this day of uh, number of new creation. Um, there's some interesting things in rabbinic literature about this. Um, the word in Hebrew for alive is composed of two letters that when you add them together makes the number 18. And if you know anyone Jewish, you should even ask them, like, what are lucky numbers? And they'll say 18 is a lucky number because of the gematria of the word alive. And um, so Jewish people will often donate in sums or multiples of 18 because it's lucky. It's the number of a life and being alive. Um, also this fun fact that um, in Pompeii, they found graffiti. There's all kinds of graffiti there actually. And it's been well preserved because ash covered that city. Um, but one of the things they found is um, someone wrote on a wall, I love the girl whose name is 545. No, no women were named numbers, but he was using gematria. And so girls were walking by me like, wait, wait, five, four, five, is that me? No, that's not me. Who, whose number is five, four, five? Is that Jennifer? Is it Jennifer? <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, so this is a way of compu computing numbers. Um, and the text from this is Revelation 13. Luke. Yes. Uh, so really quick. So gematria is kind of weird because the first 10 in Hebrew, the first 10 are 1, 2, 3, 4, yes, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Yeah. And then it's 100, 200, 3. Like they, yes. the numbers get bigger and they're not like counting straight through the alphabet. Yes. So that's how, if you look at the, yes, yeah, so if you look at the Nero one, like it has like 200, there's a letter that yeah. equals 200. Yeah. It's not Thank like you. a bunch of letters. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, so this is from Revelation chapter 13, if you want to follow along. So it says, it's talking about the second beast right now. And we're going to look at these uh, images next week. Um, the second beast makes everyone small and great, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, the beast's name or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast because it is the number of a person. Its number is 666. So there's been lots of debate about what that refers to. And again, if you're a strong futurist, you'll say there's going to be a person who comes whose name symbolizes 666 in some way, right? Um, now, in general, I'm a futurist, but in this case, I'm a preterist who's a futurist, okay? And what I mean by that is that um, I think very clearly the number refers to Nero Caesar. Um, I'll make that case um, two different ways. Uh, it's fascinating because in Greek, so if you go from Nero's name in Greek, remember Greek and Latin are both going on, and then Jews are speaking Aramaic, so it gets very confusing very fast. But in Greek, if you take Nero Caesar, and then you translate it into Aramaic, and then you do the gematria for it, it comes out to 666. Um, now, the weird part is, if you go from Latin, the, um, there's an N that drops out. And when you calculate it that way, it comes up with 616 instead of 666. Now, why this is important is because some of our early copies of the New Testament have slight differences in them. They call these textual variants. Now, 99.9% .9 .9 of cases, we're 100% sure of what the original was. But um, like if you have a Greek New Testament, it'll even say in the footnotes, like some... Texts have this. Yeah. Um, your Bible might even have a footnote. Does anyone's Bible have a footnote with that verse? Yep. Yeah. Kat, can you just read what your footnote says about that? It just says some manuscripts 616. Yeah. Some manuscripts say 616. So the interesting thing about this is if you go take Nero's name in Latin and then translate it to Hebrew and do the gematria, it comes out to 616. And so the fact that in one way it comes out to 616 and another way it comes out to 666, I think confirms that at least those first people copying down the book of Revelation 
thought. This definitely refers to Nero Caesar. And oh, they must have, the last person must have copied it wrong. Um, I know that's a little involved and crazy. Now, again, I'm a futurist, so I think, <clears throat> I think what John saw is a Nero-like figure. Um, he's going to be as crazy as Nero and as anti-Christian as Nero. And this terrible Nero-like figure is going to rise. Now, if you're Jake, you're going to say, it is Nero. If you're Jake, you're going to say the reason that they wrote 666 instead of his name was plausible deniability so the Roman government couldn't get them in trouble. <laughs> yeah, could be. Others take 666 as a symbol for the trinity of evil and imperfection. Yes. Each digit falls short of the perfect yes. number seven. Yes, I meant to say that as well, but that's exactly right. Yes, so seven's perfect number. Six is the number of humans and rebellion. Right, and sin, basically. And so it's this perfect number of sin. Well, most the most imperfect number you can have, or something like that. Yes, thank you, Michael. Absolutely. All right, I'm gonna step aside and let Jake tell us what happens in these three sets of sevens. What goes on, and as we're talking about the seven, the different sevens, we're talking about three different sets of seven that take place in chapter six through eleven, and then again they kind of get brought back up in chapter fifteen and sixteen. And they all kind of have a similar flavor. Um, there's a couple things that go on with these sets of sevens and why we pair them together. Because some people, depending on where you are, and this actually kind of blends between the different views, some people say that the seven trumpets and the seven, seven bowls are actually a repetition of each other. And some people will say that this happens chronologically, that it's like the seals first, then the trumpets, then the bowls. Some people will say, these things seem to be saying the same kind of thing three times over, getting worse. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it, there is a disagreement about whether it's chronological or not. It could be. Some people say it's not. Okay. Um, what happens for the most part is that in chapter six, we reach uh, this place where there's six seals. We talked about last time at the end of chapter five, the lamb is on the throne and they're like, he can open it. Yes. And so then he opens it. Uh, the May, first six seals are a white horse with a king on it, a uh, red horse of war, a black horse with like scales, not scales like a fish, but scales like a weight scale, um, a pale horse of famine and disease. Uh, the fifth seal is martyrs calling for justice, and the sixth seal is a natural disaster coming on. Uh, chapter seven details the 144,000 servants of God being protected by angels, by four angels who are like holding back things for this 144,000. Chapter eight then goes back to the seventh seal and it says the last seal, the seventh seal is silence. And that silence says it's for half an hour. Then that starts the trumpets. And the first trumpet is hail and fire mixed with blood. The second trumpet is something huge, the size of a city that's on fire and thrown into the sea. The third trumpet is, it gets blown and a great star falls from the sky. The fourth trumpet is a third of the sun, moon, and stars go dark. Then we get to chapter nine, which is the fifth trumpet. A star falls from the sky and is given the key to the abyss. This is um, what a lot of people go talk about Lucifer because Lucifer means star from the like fallen star. So um, a star falls from the sky and it opens up the abyss. And then a bunch of locusts that look like horses ready for battle with scorpion stingers come out of the abyss. <laughs> and then the sixth trumpet is the four angels. Um, what it seemed like to me while reading is the four angels that are the ones that were holding back for the 144,000. Those four angels are released and they start killing a third of mankind. Okay. Um, Chapter 10, this one was really interesting. So John like does this little aside and he goes, there's also seven thunders, but I was told I wasn't supposed to write down what they said, or I, I, I wasn't supposed to write down what they said. It says, like we talked about last week, it says, I was supposed to seal those ones up. So I didn't write them down. Mm -hmm. Okay, the seven thunders speak. And then in chapter 11, the two witnesses testify and are attacked by the beast. The seventh trumpet is sounded and 24 elders which we talked about last time being in the courtroom with the chairs. The seven of the 24 elders start praising the Lord God Almighty and God's temple in heaven is opened. Okay, so that's what's going on with those. It's kind of, if, if you're reading it, 
as I was reading it, I was like, wow, this is why people read Revelation and go, oh my goodness, what is happening? Because it kind of just goes bang, 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 bang. Um, Liza, next week, we're going to talk about 12, 13, and 14. So chapter 15 comes back to the sets of seven, when seven angels sing God's praises, and then seven angels come out of the temple carrying seven bowls with seven plagues. And they start pouring these plagues on the earth in chapter 16. A voice comes out of the temple, which is probably God coming from the temple, pours out of the temple and tells them to start pulling, pouring the bowls. The first is sores break out on the people. They pour the bowl out on the earth and sores start breaking out um, on the people who worship the beast. Um, the second turns the sea to blood. The third turns the river and sea, uh, river and uh, springs. I miswrote that, sorry. The river and springs to blood. Um, the fourth allows the sun to scorch the people with fire. The fifth causes darkness on the beast and his kingdom. The sixth dries up the Euphrates River, very specifically. Uh, the seventh is followed by God's voice from the temple saying that it is finished. And then it's like, hail earthquakes, a bunch of different natural, natural disasters happen all at the same time, okay? So that is kind of the whirlwind view through those chapters. Um, that's kind of the how the trumpets can kind of progress is their warnings. What's weird about the trumpets um, as opposed to the bulls is if you read all the trumpets, you'll see that there's lots of thirds. It's like a third of the sun, a third of the stars, a third of the moon is turned black. In the bulls, it's like all of everything. So it's in, in a lot of ways, there's, it seems to be like a warning is happening in the trumpets where it's like, here's a little bit of disaster. And then the bulls, it's like, you guys didn't listen. Here's the full disaster. But I, I'm confused about the seven thunders. Yes. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah, so the seven thunders is, I think, this moment where John is being told something but he's not supposed to tell us that thing. And, it, and in some ways, it's information that, tell, that reminds us that we don't know everything. Yeah. And if you're, if you're a futurist, you could go, I'm looking for all these things, but even I don't know everything that's going to happen. And I think even if like, you're a preterist, you would say, hey, the Jews were given warnings about what's going to happen in 70 AD, but they weren't given all the warnings. Right? It's like it's this level where it's trying to remind us that God yeah. is not, doesn't have to tell us everything. <laughs> All right, so uh, what we're going to do now, we're going to, um, Jake and I are going to say, okay, let's practice putting on these lenses. So we're going to do it, and then you're going to do it, okay? Yeah. So we're going to do it for the seven seals. It, uh, chapters six, seven, and the very beginning of eight are the seven seals. We're going to start with the futurist. Um, and that first slide you have there says the seven seals describe the beginning of the Great Tribulation, right? So once again, um, futurists say this is about all the events happening around related to Jesus's second coming. And so um, the first horseman that comes up, um, uh, I saw the lamb open one of the seven seals and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a loud, uh, with a voice like thunder, come. I looked and there was a white horse, its rider held a bow, a crown was given to him and he went out as a conqueror in order to conquer. Now I read these verses because there's actually two different views among futurists. Uh, most futurists say this is the conquering of the antichrist. This beastly world ruler who will come right before the end. Um, there are some futurists who say this is Jesus coming out to conquer. Um, so there's a minority view there. And this is one of the cases where I just bring it up to point out that like, in some cases, uh, different views are uh, linkable or like you can bring them together. In some cases, like, is it Jesus or the Antichrist? Those are very different things, right? <laughs> like, um, most futurists, again, they'll say it's the Antichrist because of what happens next. That they would say that the red horseman is the bloody wars that the antichrist brings and then the third horseman is the famine that comes in the aftermath of the wars that the antichrist brings and the fourth seal is all the death and destruction again that comes in the aftermath of this coming <clears throat> um so skipping through and jumping forward to chapter seven uh the 144,000 most futurists would say that is a literal number not a figurative number um, and it describes the number of ethnic Jewish people who will come to faith during that time of tribulation. So again, that's just how a futurist would read these seven seals, and they would do similar types of things with the trumpets.
the bulls. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, ahead, um, so this is the the preterist uh, view of Revelation six one through seventeen, um, and I'm just going to kind of go through it in verses one and two. Uh, they believe. Yeah, chapter, uh, chapter six. six. Yeah, we're gonna six, do chapter yeah. six for all. Yeah, four we're gonna do chapter six four different times. Yeah, right? oh, that was the first time. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So we just talked about the futurist view. This is the the preterist view. Is that remember we talked about last week? The preterists believe that pretty much everything before chapter twenty was finished by seventy A.D. Okay. So the preterist is gonna say that the rider on the white horse is most likely a Roman general who's looking at going into Israel and Jerusalem to put down an uprising, okay? The red, the red horse in chapter, in verses three and four is talking about the war that comes to, number one, Israel from the Romans, but also the infighting that's going on between the different Roman or Jewish factions at the time, because there is not all of the Jews want to rebel against Rome. And some of them are. And so there's fighting going on throughout all of Israel, especially in Jerusalem, but also Rome is coming with war. Uh, they would say that in verses five and six, that whether this be the siege of Jerusalem or it be the attack on Israel in general, that this war is gonna cause food to be more scarce and kind of this idea of famine, people are gonna be paying more and ransoming like all of their property and all this stuff and paying a bunch of extra money for food and then we get to verses seven and eight, where the famine and fighting are caused there to be so many dead bodies throughout Jerusalem and Israel that they start basically having tons of disease because they don't have the places to bury these people mm. or the time to bury them because they're busy stabbing each other. Um, the fifth seal, verses nine through 11, is reminding us that the city of Jerusalem and Israel in general is being punished not only for what it did to Jesus, but also what it did to all of the other Christian martyrs. Right? The martyrs call out for punishment and God is like, yep, that's, we're, we're doing it. Um, and then verses 12 through 17 is the fall of the Jewish state to Rome. Israel is getting thrown into turmoil. It is losing, it is getting crushed. Um, the sun, the moon, and the stars are the political, social, and religious leaders of Jerusalem. And that they are, like, they did a bunch of evil against Jesus and against Christians, and now they're being brought to bear. They are falling because they are not able to stand against their punishment. Um, there's also the reference to dropping like figs, which seems to be a reference to the fig tree that Jesus curses for bearing no fruit, saying, you Jews, even after Jesus, are not bearing fruit. You're falling mm -hmm. to the Romans. And that would be the preterist view uh, Jake, in the Predators' view, what yes. do they do with the 144,000? Do you know off the top of your head? Um, they would say that the 144,000 is, is the number of Jews who escape from Israel before the Romans come. It's, wow. it's the number of people who read Revelation and hear the prophecies about it and go, we're going to get out before the punishment comes. That? So there, there's, a weird, there's a weird thing about that is that by the time of Jesus, those tribes don't exist. Yeah. In fact, the, 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 Assyrians, the Assyrians exiled when, they, when the Assyrians conquered Israel and Judah was still left. Judah was essentially two tribes. It was Benjamin. the Benjamin and, Ju and Judah. And the other 10 tribes went with Assyria. They never returned from exile. Mm -hmm. And so when we say it's listed out by tribes, it's kind of a weird thing because it's like Jesus and none of the Jews, like th those 10 tribes haven't been around for 800 years or 600 yeah, years. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would bet that they would be able to find their genealogy. Uh, you have people that know what tribe they came from. So, they do, but none of those tribes. Yeah, it's only, it's only Jude, Judah and Benjamin because the Assyrians, the way that they would do things is they would purposely move families around to destroy culture. Mm -hmm. And so, at least as far as we know, we don't have any Jews that I know of or yeah. that I've heard ever relating themselves back to those to any of those tribes so those tribes are dead extinct yes. yeah yeah His, historically <laughs> all right uh historicists if you remember from last week historicists say uh the events john describes began to be fulfilled in the first century and then um were and have been fulfilled throughout the rest of history 
And so uh, historicists would say these seven seals, I, I won't read each one, um, but they would say the seven seals describe the rise and then the slow degradation and fall of the Roman Empire. And they would kind of pair these different seals with, again, that rise and then fall. So the first seal would be um, the time from Domitian to Commodus, uh, which was considered the golden age of the Roman Empire. Uh, the second seal, horsemen, would represent the time after Commodus to the accession of Diocletian, roughly 180 to 284. Um, that was a series of time marked by a lot of bloodshed and civil war in the Roman Empire. So that's the red horse. So yeah, if you kept going with the seals, a historicist would say, seventh seal, 476. It's the fall of the Roman Empire. And then when you turn to the trumpets, it's the next empire rising. Um, now the historicist would say the 144th, if that's true, the 144,000 being numbered is spiritual Israel. It's those faithful Christians who stayed faithful even in the midst of this crazy Roman Empire that kept persecuting them and messing with them and things like that. Okay, so idealism, if you guys remember from last time, idealism is the one that doesn't say that all of this is connected to specific events, either in the past, currently going on, or in the future. Idealists are going to be more focused on the cycles, as they would call it, of uh, the cycles of ebb and flow of empires over time. And they might, some idealists would point and say, you know what, the Jews or the Roman Empire is, is one example of the cycle, but it's not the most important. Every cycle is similar. Okay, So they would say that the first rider on the white horse represents not a specific person, but the idea of military conquest starting empires. Guy rides in is, uh, as the king, he conquers, creates a new empire. And then they would say the next step is the red horse, which is verses three and four, which is that the horse of war, which comes to every empire inevitably, is that the horse of war causes problems for the people in the country and in the country being conquered. Okay, um, They would say verses 5 and 6 is famine and drought is a consequence of war. And in all of these cycles where we have political person comes up, starts declaring wars, people start losing their basic necessities of food and water and stuff like that because that's what war brings. Then they would go on to verses 7 and 8 and they would say, yeah, as war happens and people lose access to the things that they need, diseases start running rampant and people start getting sick and dying and there's less um, able to be like less people being able to be buried if you just like think about any world war ii movie you've ever seen that's mm -hmm. kind of how this would look it's like war happens then people are starving then people are dying and people don't even have the strength to bury them that's what they would say this is kind of looking at um, they would then in verses 9 and 11 they're going to say um, in the end like when empires are dying and when they're doing wrong they end up kind of inevitably persecuting christians and people who are trying to bring goodness and the martyrs of every time this happens are going to are call out for justice and god gives them justice um now we're gonna get a little weird really quick okay <laughs> so all of that said um Verses 12 through 17, most idealists would then go and say that this is a reference to the final coming of Christ. <laughs> and that sounds really weird <laughs> if you think about it. And the, what, basically what they're trying to get at is this idea of God lets these empires rise and fall. And then he redeems people newly out of it. But it's kind of this idea of eventually, instead of a new kingdom coming, Christ is going to come. And we don't know which cycle that's going to be a part of. Mm. So it's kind of that the fact that no matter what cycle, if you are 15 cycles away from the last one, you can still hope and, be li and live in the hope that Christ is going to come back and restore everything. And the answer to every cycle, whether that be World War II and Germany, or whether that be the French Revolution, or whether that be the fall of Rome, the answer for every believer is that in the end, Christ wins and the cycles stop. Okay. Um, again, we'll stick around afterwards, but we're going to spend the next 13 minutes of you practicing. So if you turn to your Bible to Revelation chapter 16, 
Um, now it's your turn to do us to do together uh, what Jake and I just did for you. Yep. It's going to be very important that you go to Revelation chapter 16 because yes. you will need it to do what we're going to do. You know what? Let's start with, uh, yeah, let's start with Futurist. And you have um, just some notes. So again, our goal right now is to practice putting on these different lenses. So for the sake of argument, for the next two minutes, we're all futurists. Welcome to the futurist world. Um, is it, which verses is it, Luke? That 16, we're... 1 through 9. 16, okay. 1 through 9, and see if you can see anything in there. Because of time. In 16, 1 through 9. You're supposed to read it with a futurist lens, and then we're going to share what jumped out of you is like, oh, that makes sense with this lens, or that doesn't. So you're looking for areas of um, resonance with this lens, or dissonance. So, yes. Kind of shame those who got the mark, so that has to come after the mark happens. Yep, which... good. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So the mark of the beast and the worshiping image, the the bowls of judgment are being poured out on those people. So yes, it comes after that has been instigated. Good. What else do you guys see? It's fitting with this. The um, oceans couldn't have all everything in the ocean couldn't have died in the first yep. seventy years. Mm. Also, go on a cycle and die every. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's like a one and done kind of thing. It seems yeah. like. Yep, that's fair. Yeah. Uh-huh. Anything else jump out to you is But if you think about it and you go back to the first century, mm -hmm. that could have been the Mediterranean Sea. Or the Dead Sea. Or the Dead Sea. I mean, just a body of water where everything died. Mm -hmm. Because they would not have known how much water was on the rest. So <laughs> Yes. That's not. Future. I don't know. Is that? Future? Yeah. Is that yeah. Nancy, we have to. You're be defending future. a different view that, right now. That's called preterist. <laughs> All right. Let's do it again. We're gonna read it again in your head, but this time, pretend you're a preterist. Okay. When do you your best, put on your preterist lens, and Jake's gonna give you some guidelines. When you prepare for the preterist lens, definitely read through all of the ideas because they're more historical based. So it's gonna be useful to have like the history that some people might connect these things to. So read those and then read the passage and see if any of those things connect for you. Yeah, there was a clarification question. Preterists would view this as uh, talking about the fall of Jerusalem. Yeah. And the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. This is the, the destruction of the temple like is involved in these, at least at the next part of it a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so they would say this is about the fall of Jerusalem. They were being persecuted by the Romans. Yeah. Well, even, and, and the Romans are coming not only to kill Christians, but just to like kill all of the Jews and destroy their religion. Mm -hmm. Because prior to AD 70, Judaism was one of the few legal religions in the Roman Empire that wasn't polytheism. Actually, might have been the only one yeah. that was allowed that wasn't Roman religion. And Nero revoked that and said, we're going to go kill the temple to let them know that their religion is no longer allowed. And this was written prior to that? So some people, yeah, this is, this is a fun conversation. <laughs> Good yeah. question. So there's an argument. Some people will say that it was written in 65. Some people will say that it was written in like 80. And some people will say it was written in like 96. So all preterists would say it was written in 65. Before. Or 65 to 67. So it's future yes. to them. Right. Yeah, but not... Future to us, yes. Do we have evidence that points to one date or the other? Or is it just kind of like, eh, one of these three, probably? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so I think me and Luke disagree about that evidence a little bit. <laughs> um, no. uh, what did you guys read that like does yeah. make sense with that view? Does yeah. any, yeah. Yeah. I think the same verse that I was looking at before with the, like the futurist, or yeah, futurist view of the mm -hmm. scorching men with fire. I mean, if you apply that to the, the the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of Jerusalem, that sort of thing. I mean, Nero. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Use, use <laughs> Christians as torches yeah. for his gardens. Cool guy. But <laughs> so where were the Jews mark of the beast? Well, so what was the point? point? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, good question. That's a fair question. <laughs> so what, what, did, what did you say, Kat? What was the mark, of the, mark of, the of the beast? Mark of the beast for the Jews. So the, um, they would actually, so they would say that the mark of the beast part is actually talking about the Roman legionnaires and those who are the Jews who are loyal to Rome. So they would say it's not a physical mark, but that it is a, the fact that we are 
following Caesar. And even if you thought about, um, if you think about like the Roman soldiers, helmets and or shields being like wrist, head, different stuff like that. And um, so is that like when it talks about the actual 666 and the mark of the beast? Yeah. Like, what so they would say Nero that? Caesar yeah. is that. Is one. the guy in charge and, every, and, and everybody who's loyal to him. He's going to do his bidding. That's his yeah. 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 But that would not be Jews. <laughs> oh, it would be tax collectors. Maybe. Yeah, it could sure. be like, yeah. and, and, her, and Herodians, right? Yeah, yeah so Herodians. Dur during the, right, when we talked about like there's multiple groups that are fighting in the Jewish groups, so the zealots kind of take control a little bit and they start stabbing a lot of people. But the, like, the people who are loyal to Rome are still around. Like the Jews who are loyal to Rome, like the Herodians, in, originally, they're probably not called the Herodians by that point, but there are still tons of Jews who are loyal to Rome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any anything that stands out that could go with the preterist view? In verse two, uh, it says, "The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the land, and ugly festering sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped its image." I believe wasn't there a common practice to worship the like Caesar yeah. or the ruler, right? Yep. And, like, it was like that. It was like a religion of the yep. king. There's a religion of Caesar, and there are people like even like in Caesarea Philippi, which is in Israel, people would go up there and worship right. in temples to Caesar. Yeah. Um, anything else that stands out that could work with the preterist view? So I don't know yep. enough about the actual like all the different things. So when it says in like what, what Ben just read in verse two, yep. Was there a situation where there was like a plague of some kind that broke out? Yeah. So. Um, during the siege of Jerusalem, if you think about Jerusalem, they're a walled city and they're trying to protect against the Romans who are not letting anyone out. And the Romans um, famously started polluting the water sources of Jerusalem. And there's even like reports of blood running through the streets because of people dying and them not having anywhere to bury them because they buried everyone outside Jerusalem, not inside Jerusalem. So there's just people everywhere. Um, so, sorry, can you tell me what, uh, the, like about the, the plague? plague yeah, you know, so there is, there is definitely plague going on. And there are reports, um, I read a couple different, like, historical letters basically saying, like, just like average Jews being like, I really hope that uh, we stop fighting soon and that we're done. Because even, like, the zealots were still running around stabbing people they thought were loyal to Rome inside Jerusalem. And then just leaving their bodies around and... So, but, but that doesn't say a plague. Yeah, no, 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 what I'm saying is there was definitely a plague. We have writings talking about people that there was a plague and it's kind of the thing that happens when you leave bodies just kind of lying around throughout a city that doesn't have clean water. I hope you'll continue doing what we did half of. Um, and I'm sorry, we talked too long. Um, we're trying to learn from previous weeks. So we will um, make adjustments for next week. Luke will talk a little less and let you do some more study. Um, but uh, I did want to just say two things in closing. Um, and this is, again, a clarification of something uh, I answered last week. Last week I said your job at every point is to study it and say, what would a first century person, which lens would have made the most sense to them? Now, there can be different applications later, but you want to, you want to start with what did it mean then? It was written for us, but not originally to us. Now, I will say, though, um, with these three sets of sevens, um, I guess I would backpedal on that answer a little bit and say um, it makes sense to be consistent too. Not in Revelation as a whole, but with if, you, if you're like convinced without a doubt that the first seal, that the predator's view makes the most sense, it, you can't just like skip like, well, for the, but the second seal is historicist and the third seal is futurist, right? Like you, it, what it meant then, like they would have understood one thing as this whole group. And so if you're convinced about one of these views, I think you actually should be consistent with yeah, the seven well, seals think, and the seven trumpets and the seven bowls. Um, I, I, I think they probably are idealists. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I know we are, are not saying top down very much. This is how you should read it. Again, Jake tends to read these as a preterist. I tend to read them as a futurist. Um, we have good reasons why we think those things. Um, but we're trying to again, give you tools to practice reading in different ways. Um, and I know there are people here who read all these different ways. So yes, next week we're going to do the sections uh, of visions we didn't do 
tonight. So uh, next week will be 12 through 14. Yeah, thank you. And 17, 18, and 19. Yes. And we're also going to talk about um, apocalyptic images and symbols. All right, thank you guys for coming. Uh, let me close this in yep. prayer, and then again, we'll be here. We're happy to hang out as long as you want to. So uh, let's pray. God, uh, thank you that uh, even in the midst of our confusion, again, you hold the keys to history. And, um, and I do pray that you would give us both humility and a desire just to keep trying and keep at it as we study this book. I know um, for some people it can be a little frustrating to maybe have thought it was simple and straightforward and realize that there are more views and maybe um, some of the people here aren't even sure about which one's right. Um, I, I just pray that all of us would keep, um, number one, submitting ourselves to your word. None of us want to say, we know, we for sure know, or we are the masters of this. We submit ourselves to you. And would you be our teacher, Holy Spirit guide each of us as we continue submitting ourselves to your word, surrendering ourselves to your word and seeking to obey that and guide us in that. In your name we pray. Amen.